Hey guys, Haz here at Shield K9, and uh, I'm really excited to announce the first ever interview with another industry professional on the Shield K9 Dog Training Channel. I think um, it's definitely time to bring some other voices in, some other experiences in, and um, you know, give you guys a little bit of a different take on uh, some of the things that we like to talk about on here. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Michael Nesbeth. Mike on Instagram and he is the owner operator here at uh, Grassroots Canine where we are um, and where is Grassroots Canine Mike? Uh, well our, our main location is near a small town called Dundalk. We're just probably about an hour and 20 minutes north of um, Toronto. Uh, we, we have a, a few different locations you know our main one is here uh, but we also have Grassroots Canine Ottawa, Grassroots Canine Maryland, and grassroots canine Georgina. So, and where's Georgina? Georgina is near uh, the Keswick kind of area. Oh, okay. Look at this canine Mike franchising. Yeah. Something so, like it. Something like it. <laughs> so, me and canine Mike, uh, we've known each other for a few years um, and we've done some small things back and forth. But the reason why I want to bring canine Mike on for the first ever interview, and hopefully, we're going to do more interviews with other um, industry professionals is um, because K9 Mike, aside from being a well-respected member of the K9 training and sales community, uh, he has a little bit of a different perspective on some things than I do. We might agree on a lot of things, but I know we disagree on some things, so I like that. Um, and also, really, K9 Mike is, and I'm saying K9 Mike, his name's Michael, okay? Either you or, know, call either me or. K9 Mike, right. Michael. I, you you know, know, I'm giving him a nickname. <laughs> I don't want to give him a nickname. I don't think he's cool enough to have a nickname. No one, no, I don't have a nickname. Well, we'll make one for you. All right. Okay. We'll make one. Anyways, so um, he's a legit good dude. And I don't say that, you know, everybody's like, oh, this guy's a good dude and that guy's a good dude. He's a good dude in the sense that, um, you know, he's honest and he'll, he'll do something nice for you even if it doesn't benefit him. And I think that's definitely, you know, a, a, a quality in somebody that I really appreciate. Um, you know, this is a big industry, but it's also a small industry. And in that, you know, when people say things about other people in this industry, it tends to get back to the person that, that, that things were said about, too, okay? And um, I know for a fact that, you know, K.I. Mike and me, we like I said, we've done some things back and forth, but also, um, Mike is kind of almost a little bit in the same industry in some ways than I am. And, and sometimes we compete a little bit for business here and there. And I know in certain situations um, when it would have maybe benefited Mike to not say such nice things about me, he said nice things about me and, 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 and tried to send a little business my way um, and vice versa. So I really appreciate that about Mike. No, man, same, same to you. You know, I, I, because the industry is big and small at the same time, I think it's important when there's you know, good quality people, um, that we, we don't have this famine mentality, you know, and, and we try and uplift and, and help one another. Has has done the exact same thing for me and multiple times. Uh, so that's kind of the approach that, that, that I try and take with it. All right. Well, you know what? There's enough uh, mutual back rubs happening now. Let's get, let's get started on some, some topics. So, um, again, guys, this is my first interview, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to do the best I can to really get the most out of Mike because he has a lot to give. Um, and we're going to kind of discuss back and forth on a number of topics. We're going to be covering uh, puppy selection, um, both for working and also for pet. 
for family situations. We're going to be covering uh, different breeds, like breeds that we prefer to train, uh, again, for family situations and also for working situations. Uh, we're going to be talking about the selection of, of, of dogs for police work, because Canine uh, Mike does a lot of um, police dogs here at Grassroots. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, our preference in breeds, and we're actually going to maybe even work a few dogs here. And uh, we're going to kind of talk about what we're doing while we're doing it and, and, and compare, and maybe we'll have a little argument. I don't know. But hopefully. Hopefully we have a, a little banter back and forth. That's right. You know, it's not fun if everybody's getting along. So let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, first, before we uh, get into the nitty-gritty, um, I want Mike to kind of tell you guys a little bit about what he does. Again, he's in Ontario, um, and he's only about an hour and a half from me. Uh, so, you know, Mike also, by the way, has a YouTube channel that he's recently started. Um, and yeah. what is that YouTube channel, Mike? So the YouTube channel is Grassroots K9, the letter K, number nine. Uh, I'm sure we can put it in the, the details of this video, but uh, if you want to check out some more, you guys like what you see, uh, you can head over there, and we've got plenty of videos up there. Okay, and, and guys, you know, like I have my style and, and my way of describing things. Mike has a different style, and he, he like I said already, he has different perspectives on things. And if you're interested in dog training, um, and you kind of want to understand the industry and, and, and the, the mentality behind a lot of the things that we do, it's important to get more than one perspective. So, you know, I hope you, you give my, Mike a, a check out and a, and a follow. Uh, he also has an Instagram. What's your Instagram? Yep, just uh, at grassroots K9, letter K, number nine, or my personal one is K9 underscore Mike. Okay, so check, it, check him out on YouTube, check him out on Instagram. Um, and uh, if you like what you see, give the man a like, give him a subscribe, and give him a follow. Anyways, let's talk a little bit about puppy selection, everybody's favorite topic. Let's start with working puppies, whether it's for police work, sport work, or personal protection work. If you're looking at a litter of puppies, Mike, what is it, what is it that you're looking for? Yeah, so I think that there are some like common threads between how you would look at puppies and how I would look at puppies. Um, obviously, like regardless of, of whether it's sport, police, or personal protection, uh, I want to look for a puppy that shows like overall confidence, you know? Um, what, even amongst litter mates, I like them to have that scorpion tail sticking way up in the air and you know, they get brought into a new area and it's like they own that room. Uh, th that's super important for me off the bat. Uh, and then obviously I, I, I like to see a puppy that'll like chase after a rag or a toy. They don't get really spooked by loud noises uh, or if they happen to be spooked by something, I want to really notice that they have super quick recovery time, right? I, I think an important thing uh, that we need to kind of put out in the industry and make sure everyone knows is that every dog has its limits um, and especially puppies. We're looking at babies when, when we're kind of evaluating them. Uh, so I actually want to see them kind of hit that limit where they feel uncomfortable about something, uh, and, but I want to see them make the choice to get over it and continue to go forward. Um, and some dogs will not get over it. And it's, you, for instance, I'm sure a lot of you may have, you know, accidentally stepped on your puppy's foot or stepped on its tail and it may whimper and run away and go hide in the corner. Uh, when I'm looking for recovery time, what I want to see is I accidentally, you know, stepped on that puppy's foot and it whimpers and then it runs back up to me and wants to play again. And it's, it doesn't take things so personal, right? Because eventually in that dog's life, as it ages, um, it's going to get pushed to, to areas where it's going to feel uncomfortable and we don't want them to shut down uh, because then we can't continue to grow and we can't continue to progress. So is that similar to what? what Very similar. So if you guys, I'm sure most of you guys that are watching my channel have seen my puppy selection videos. I have a couple up there and we have one that went a little bit viral um, where we're basically doing very similar things to what Mike was saying. We didn't step on any paws or tails. Unintentionally. Don't go out there and start stomping on puppies. <laughs> yes, and don't do that. But we do make them uncomfortable. You'll see sometimes I pick them up a little bit rough and I want to see how the puppy responds to that. And it's not because we're mean or anything, it's because if we're selecting a dog for working purposes, we're looking for specific qualities within the dog that, and one of those qualities is a resilience to stress and the ability to overcome and, and continue to function through stress. And I shouldn't need to explain to you why that would be important for a working dog, whether it's a, a, a sport dog, a police dog, a search and rescue dog, whatever kind of work you're doing, I think the resilience to stress is very important. Yeah, uh, and, and, and that kind of dovetails into also, it, it, I apply that even to like pet selection, you know? You're gonna make mistakes as, as an owner and as a handler, and you don't want them to be 
these huge detrimental events, right? If you know that your dog and your puppy can, can recover from your mistakes, we're human, we're gonna make mistakes, um, it sets that dog up for so, such a higher chance of success in whatever that outlet is gonna be. Okay, and, and let me ask you this, Mike, what age do you like to look at puppies? Everybody's got their thing, I got my thing. What is your age? What's your magic age to look at puppies? See, I, I wish I had a number to tell you. Um, you know, I, I like to see puppies, uh, you know, at that, around that six week mark. And if it's an ideal world and I could still see that whole litter again, I would like to see them at eight weeks and then at 10 weeks as well. Um, w one of the things that I look for, uh, if any of you have had litters or been around puppies, you'll see some days one puppy looks like the rock star and the next day that puppy doesn't look that good as anymore. Uh, so when, I'm, when I get to see the dogs from that six week to eight week to 10 week, I get a better baseline of, of okay, this dog has consistently performed this way versus okay, at 10 weeks, maybe that dog looks like a rock star, but at six and eight weeks, he was at the bottom uh, of my list. So, so I try and find consistency as well between that, those, those age gaps. And that's what Mike said is important. So like the puppy selection videos I generally do, um, I've only done, I think, one or two. Uh, we are, we're showing the puppies at six weeks. And I like that first look at six weeks because I think if there's something really strong in there genetically, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it tends to express itself at six weeks, not all weeks. And like what Mike was saying, I like to see them progressively, you know? But again, if, if, if you're, you might not have the opportunity to see the puppies that often, so you're kind of gonna have to base it on how much of the uh, exposure to the puppies that you have and what you see at that time. So what Mike was saying is really important because I've done this with litters where I've had six weeks, I've done a test. I've just taken them to a brand new place, run them through everything, seen how they react. And then at 10 weeks or eight weeks, I've done the same thing and I've had different results yeah. where puppies that maybe weren't that impressive all of a sudden come to the forefront and it's a different picture. Yeah. And then the one that was the rock star kind of moves back a little yeah. bit. Yeah. But I, I don't know about you, Mike, but I will say this. Usually if I see something really bad, like really like, oh boy, you know, the nerves. And usually when, when I'm saying bad, I'm saying nerves. Like you bring the puppy in and it completely shuts down. It's like, you know what? I can't deal with all the environmental stress and, and the, 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 the auditory stress and, and everything else that's going on. And the puppy just shuts down or runs and hides, doesn't want to come out, doesn't want to move around. Um, for me, generally, if I see that, it usually, I don't usually see, I got, the puppy will improve, don't get me wrong. And, and you know somebody that doesn't know maybe what they're looking at down the road wouldn't be able to tell that that puppy has some environmental issues uh, or maybe isn't that resilient to stress. But usually if I see something really, really bad like that, it doesn't, it's there. Yeah, it, it, and it's, and it's that, that's a key point. And I think even, you know, kind of a precursor to this whole conversation, the reason why selection is so important is because there's only so much that training can accomplish. Right? So we want to select the best prospect possible in our puppies. Now, again, even with doing all these tests and there's no master answer and we're still getting, like I've been wrong plenty of times with puppies, um, but following the testing that I'll do in the selection process, um, it sets me up for a better chance at success, definitely. Um, but our, our training can only take us so far and we, with training, we kind of want to complement what's already there genetically, right? And, and, and kind of, at, to the best of our ability, get to 100% of what those genetics can put forward. And that's why selection is important. Now, let me ask you this, Mike. I came to your place, was it like four or five months ago, and he had a Malinois puppy in an outdoor run. And I walked past that puppy, and then I looked again at him because there was something about him that made me look at him again. And I came up to the fence, and the way that puppy was looking at me, he wasn't looking at me scared. He wasn't looking at me angry, he was looking through me. And you don't normally see that look in a puppy, so I put my hand to the fence and he tried to bite me and I said, wow, this is a nice puppy, Mike. <laughs> and uh, let me ask you this, Mike, that puppy, that, that puppy you raised, you, you bred yeah, here, you right. raised here. Um, do you care to share the, uh, the, the mother at least? Or? Yeah, so the mother, well probably later on in this video, I'll take the mother out and, and we can uh, work her. The, the sire to that litter is a, a police active police dog now, so it would make that puppy a second generation um, for us here. Um, so he's actually gone right now. He's, he's 
grown up a little bit. He's at a, at a police department now and started his basic training. But So let me ask you this, Mike. When you saw that puppy at six weeks, was, there an, was it good? Was it bad? Was it meh? Yeah, so I, I absolutely knew at six weeks old, uh, that was my favorite puppy. Really? Uh, out of the litter, I could see, you know, it, it, not to be like mystical or, or, or sound crazy, but there is something about a dog's eyes that can say a lot to you. That, and kind of like what has was, was, he would look at six, eight weeks old, um, he would look at people, a new person, me, uh, the exact same way. Um, and he, he's not looking at you like, oh no, are you going to hurt me? Uh, he's looking at you like he wants to bring it to you. Yeah, and it's and I think a lot of people when we're talking about this type of stuff, and you see it online a lot with people posting videos of puppies, they mistake nerves and they mistake um, you know frustration for true social aggression and confidence. Yeah, definitely. Like we you know we can we can take a litter of um, Springer spaniels and back tie them. Uh, yeah. and, and frustrate them enough that they're going to show pretty big and bark and you know we take them offline and those dogs don't want to well for the most part a Springer Spaniel doesn't want to uh, do anything other than you know maybe play fetch with you uh, so there's a big difference between frustration um, and then actual intent and believe it or not that intent is really like, I know that I chase after it all the time I know has is definitely chasing after that with his breeding program um, but it's not that easy to come across dogs like that, that, that and it's not easy to describe i think that's yeah. important you know you can't say look for this this and this there are some dogs that just there's something you have to be around them for a while and i think listen me and mike i i personally haven't been doing this for 30 years and i know i'm me pretty either. sure i mean <laughs> he's, a, he's a little bit older i think than me but i don't I don't think he's been doing it for 30 years either, but there are some people, they've been in this business for a long time and they still can't recognize intent. And I think recognizing intent is a combination of experience and it's, and it's something else. You know, it's because dog training, I always say it's a skill, it's a craft, but it's also an art. And, and I think it's even more so from a breeding perspective because you see a lot of fantastic trainers, yeah. um, you know, that breed but they don't really have a lot of success with the breeding program and vice versa you see a lot of breeders that breed and they have a fantastic breeding program but maybe not so much success on the training side so obviously we're both we're, we're always shooting for for everything and you know mike has produced obviously some dogs that for him and his breeding program it's a success because your breeding program was the primary focus mike so as we're breeding we breed to try and produce police dogs um so that being said, we want them to have super confident environmentals and, and you know, not be afraid to walk anywhere. Um, we need them to hunt until they drop. So they keep looking until they find it or their end comes. And we're gonna show you guys hunt later. Check out Mike's channel. I know he did a video on hunt drive. We're not gonna get as in depth as what Mike did on his video, um, but, and, and I might do a video later. I'm gonna copy everything Mike did and I'm gonna take full credit for it. Perfect. Um, but but uh, no, to, to be serious, we are gonna show some hunting uh, exercises because why why is hunt important, Mike? So specifically in regards to police dog, you know, most dogs, most of, of what they're doing is actually hunting for something, right? So if they're, let's say, uh, they're a drug dog, right? They, they need to be able to hunt to find the odor of, of drugs. If they're a bomb dog, they need to hunt to find the odor of bombs. If they're tracking, tracking is an extension of hunt. They need to go hunt for the person. Uh, if they're doing building searches, pretty much every facet of police dog work is entangled with hunt. So you can have a dog that really is the best biting dog that you've ever seen, but if it can't hunt, it's not gonna be able to find the bad guy to bite. Can't find him, you can't bite him. Exactly. So I think guys, just quickly on hunt, for me, with ideal primarily now, I did, I have done Malinois, I've produced Malinois, but my, my program currently is focused on the working German Shepherd dog. Mike, Mike breeds uh, Malinois, I think you breed both registered and uh, herders. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and for those people that don't know, a herder is, um, why don't you tell people what a herder is, Mike? So a herder, a lot of times you'll hear them referred to as Malinois um, or Dutch Shepherds at times. Um, basically, it's a, a breed for, of, of these dogs from Europe. Uh, that generally come from the KMPV bloodline and program. Uh, they're known for having super high prey um, and super high drive and 
the biting style uh, that I personally like. The pushing grips? That pushing grip, full mouth, uh, staying active while they're biting. And um, for again, guys, if you, you check out Mike's channel, he does a lot of uh, grip stuff. Um, I know I do a little grip stuff, but I'm pretty sure Mike has more grip stuff on his channel, so you can check it out, and, and especially if you're interested in the, is the suit work, whether you're doing sport work or, or protection work or police service work, um, you know, Mike, you, you do seminars, right? Yeah, yeah, so we, we travel and, and do seminars. I'm, I'm back now, uh, just came back a couple weeks ago um, from in the States, and I'm going down to Georgia next week, so we travel and do quite a bit of- What are you gonna be doing in Georgia, Mike? Uh, in Georgia, it's a, a police, Georgia Police Canine Association. They're having a conference, um, so it's a, a free training uh, for all law enforcement officers and uh, handlers. Uh, and there's going to be a group of instructors, and we're going to come. They're going to. I'm going to go down there, and uh, dogs are going to come out, and we're going to help them with any problems that they may be having. Um, primarily, we're going to focus quite a bit at my station on grip development um, and biting styles. Uh, but it's. I'm pretty excited to get down there. Okay, well, lucky Mike. He gets to go take some bites and uh, develop some 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 dogs and, that are actually doing something from a uh, real working perspective. So. You know, that's definitely uh, something that, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, appreciate. Um, let's talk a little bit about older dogs, selecting older dogs. Because we talked about puppies, guys, but Mike and I are both often in the position where we can't wait on puppies or we just don't have enough puppies um, to satisfy the needs of both our programs. So in many cases, we have to look for older dogs. Now, Mike does more on the police canine side of things. I do a little bit more on the personal protection side of things, though we both kind of do. Sometimes I know Mike sells some protection dogs and I occasionally sell some police dogs too. And um, we often have to look at older dogs that are already you know, between eight months and two years old um, to make our selection. So Mike, why don't you say, why don't you just give some, some quick pointers on what you look for when somebody is showing you an older dog. Yeah, so first things first, uh, I uh, have to define the criteria of, of what the dog, like what the job is that I'm looking for this dog. Uh, so for the most part, it's police dogs that I'm testing for. Uh, so my first step is, is I always test environmentals. And the way that I do that is I try and handle the dog and take that dog into a place that it's never been before. So, uh, and I want it to be an indoor place with the option for maybe open graded stairs, um, shiny floors, slick surfaces, dark rooms. And I, I want to see the dog do all of those things uh, without having to be lured with food or, or playing with a ball while it's doing that. Uh, most, to be honest with you, 75% of the dogs that don't make it um, to the program uh, fail in the environmental aspect of things. Uh, so that's first and foremost what I test. Uh, if they pass that, then we go to some of the hunt tests and we'll, we're gonna show you guys some of those exercises later on and what we do, uh, but we, we take a ball. So I like to sometimes use a, use a novel item, so something that they haven't, it's not like their favorite ball, uh, but I just have a ball in my truck and I'm gonna, we're gonna use my ball today um, and, and we see if, if they'll hunt for that novel item. Uh, when I'm testing hunt, I like to test and, and time it. So I'm not so concerned with the dog actually finding the, the item, uh, but I'm more concerned with how intense they are and how committed they are to hunting and for how long they're gonna, they'll hunt independently for. So Mike, you're testing environmentals, okay? First you're doing, testing environmentals, then you're testing hunt, okay? And then what else are you doing? And then if they pass those both of those tests, then usually I finish dependent upon the dog's age um, with the bike work kind of scenario and testing. Uh, so again, if it's an older dog that should be further along and have the maturity level, um, we have to match that that testing, that bite work testing to that dog's, uh, or the expectations that we'll have of that dog, right? Uh, generally what we do uh, in the bite work test is I wanna see that the dog doesn't rely solely on equipment um, for queuing up on someone. Um, so you can do maybe stalking tests, uh, even sometimes just putting them on the table and seeing if they'll target, uh, you know, without having a sleeve or a bike suit on. Uh, and then after they do that test, uh, I just go and give them a grip um, and see how well they, their biting style is naturally um, and see how they would deal with feeling uncomfortable while they're in that grip. You know, I, I don't expect it to be perfect, uh, but I do expect them to stay committed to, to what they have, even when they feel a little bit of adversity. 
So you know what I think we'll do, guys, is I brought my young dog, Gage. If you watch my channel, you know Gage is my upcoming IGP dog. I'm going to have Mike see if he would select Gage to do police service work. All right, and, and that'll be kind of an interesting thing. We, we probably won't do everything that Mike would do just because of time, obviously, but we'll run Gage through some stuff because um, he hasn't done anything like, you know, I don't do hunt testing with the ball or any of that kind of stuff. I'm pretty sure I know what's there, but maybe we'll find out that it's not there. So either way, Mike's gonna look at Gage and um, we'll, we'll show you actually with a real dog what it is that he does and, and, and maybe what it is you should be looking for if you're interested in a dog um, for that type of stuff. But I think what Mike said, I think what Mike said is really important about selecting the right dog for the right job. Police service work, personal protection work, and sport work are similar but different. And depending on your goals within any of those three venues, um, the type of dog you're looking for might differ. Like, I'm not looking for the level of hunt drive and just drive in general in my personal protection dogs. Because sometimes what comes along with drive is a lot of uh, hyperactivity and a lot of energy and a lot of intensity. And the energy, intensity, and hyperactivity I might want in a police dog, I'm probably not going to want in a personal protection dog because for the average family, that's not going to be something that they want to live with. Um, and then for sport work, again, uh, maybe what I'm looking for in sport work might be a little bit... Police work and sport work are very similar, and I think it's important. People always talk about real dog versus sport dog, and I think it's really important, like Mike, to be... And I think Mike thinks the same as me. These dogs are the same dogs. Yeah. They might be doing different jobs, but they're the same dogs. The, the, sport, the, sport, uh, the sport world is what provides the dogs for the police world and even for the personal protection world. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was gonna, all, all of these dogs through history have been bred through sport lines, you know? So like it's, they're coming from the sport world. So to me, that real dog versus sport dog argument doesn't really hold any, and there's no grounds to it uh, because a good dog is where you find it. And it, it, whatever venue that dog takes is what that where that dog's going and where that outlet is. But there's plenty of dogs that compete in sport that would make amazing police dogs, and then there's plenty of police dogs that would make amazing sport dogs. So that's right. And I think it's also important to understand that what might disqualify one dog from one world, and this is where sometimes we run into the arguments. I think with the sport world especially for sports like IGP um, and KMPV and stuff like this, the one thing that you don't generally see in the sport is a test of environmentals, okay? Whereas with the police service dogs, and this is where, like Mike was saying, 75% of dogs fail. Yeah. So you see a lot of dogs, they'll go on the field and they'll rip it up in the routine because it is a routine. It's People kind of poo-poo the routine, but if you haven't done the routine and you haven't trained for the routine and you haven't shot for power and perfection in the routine, you don't know what a grind it is on the dogs. But that being said, it's not the same as a dog. Um, you know, it can, it can hide some environmental issues. Yeah. And there are some really well-known sport dogs, some very successful sport dogs that have had environmental issues. Yeah, what do you De think yeah definitely. So, you know, there's, and, and it's, that being said, there's also, when it comes to being a vendor for police dogs, I think that it's important to know that we can take dogs out. I can take a dog that may be unsure on slippery surfaces and condition that dog to feel better about himself on, on slippery surfaces. But I think that we lose a bit of ethics when we do that for police work. And you don't lose ethics if you do that in sport work, right? Because we're essentially, we're kind of shadow covering up that there is an issue there and like that can be dangerous in the real world application but in sport it it's not dangerous right it doesn't and it doesn't mean that that dog is a bad dog it just means hey this dog is For a better job yeah it, it, he fits that job way better right if i was testing i don't compete in igp or any sport but if i was testing for a dog in those sports, I wouldn't stress so, so much if I just wanted to compete with the dog over environmentals. Like I wouldn't say how's the dog in a really dark room. Like it would still be important to me just because of personal preference. But if I only wanted that dog to do that, not to, and only not minimizing that the sport is something easy, um, that's not what I'm saying, but if I wanted it to do that, that wouldn't be a, like a, a, a real high priority on my list uh, of, of what must be there. And let me talk a little bit, since we're on the sport dog versus real dog comparison, let me say on the police dog side, like dog that 
would probably pass selection for most departments. Um, might not make such a good sport dog, and the grind is the reason, right? The grind, the training grind. When you're putting that power and that precision, I'm not talking about if you just want a title, I'm talking about if you want to win and you want to get on the upper levels. I don't care what sport it is. It is a hyper-competitive field. The best trainers in the world are competing in these sports. And you cannot do that with a dog that can't handle the grind, the day in, day out grind, tracking, obedience, protection, or whatever it is you're doing in your specific sport, that grind, that training grind breaks a lot of dogs. Even when you're doing it in a good way, even when you're using a lot of positive reinforcement and a lot of the latest training techniques. Sorry about that guys, battery uh, died on us so we just had to make some quick changes. Anyways, getting back to the discussion of sport versus real, um, I think it's important, like I said already with Mike, that, that, that we agree that the dogs are the same dogs, but what we look for in different dogs um, might change depending on the job. Here's the thing, you know, with, with, with dog sport that um, I think, you know, Mike was saying it's maybe not an ethical issue, um, you know, to, to, you know, use a dog for sport that has environmental issues. And I agree with him, but I will say it is an ethical issue for me to breed a dog that has genetic environmental issues. Because we've already said the pool for sport, uh, for, for working dogs comes from the sport dog side of things. And there are, like I said, there are some fantastic dogs, some big names that you see in a lot of pedigrees that were known to have, um, so were known to have issues to, um, environmentally. And these dogs were bred time and time again because maybe people weren't as honest as they should have been. And that's why you see the, environmentals, the environmental issues cropping up to the degree that they, they do crop up, unfortunately, in a lot of German Shepherds and Belgian Malinois. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm absolutely, like that's, when I was saying criteria for sport, I'm speaking specifically if I'm buying a dog just to compete with in sport. Any dog that's being bred, I would even put it to pet dogs that has environmental issues, should be removed from the breeding pool. Like it doesn't mean it's a bad dog, and, and that per but that dog does not help in making the dogs better than they are. And, and to me, that's what the purpose of breeding is: is to not just maintain and, and keep and, and try and reproduce the same dogs, but to try and produce dogs that are even better than the last generation. And I think it's important to say from a breeding perspective, in my opinion anyways, um, not all police dogs are breeding dogs. In fact, most of them are not. And not all sport dogs, in fact, most of them are not, are not breeding dogs either. Yeah, uh, and I agree with that. I think, and, and to be fair, I'm by, I don't consider myself a breeder. So when, when I am breeding and when I am having litters here, I don't sell puppies. Like all, all of our breeders, I breed specifically for me to raise in our program. And that, so I, I can play a little bit with it because I have the space and I get to see these dogs develop until adult, from puppyhood to adulthood, and they stay here with me. And of course, I don't, you know, anyone that tells you that they breed dogs and they have a 100% success rate, my advice is to, to run the other way. I definitely have dogs that I breed that, that wash, um, but that's not, a, what I try and do is make that less and less every single litter, and I try and enhance what I have. And I, I take accountability and ownership for what I breed. I know Haz is the same way. If Not that I've ever had an issue, uh, and I've had plenty of dogs from Haz that we've raised in the police program and, and placed them uh, with agencies. If I ever had an issue, there's not a doubt in my mind that Haz would take that dog back. And he'd say, hey Haz, because it's gonna happen. You can have the best producing dogs, and sometimes things are gonna come up. Sometimes those environmental issues are still gonna sneak in there. But the responsible thing to do is recognize that and not hide it, uh, and then move forward and, and, and continue to aim to produce better dogs and not be, have what they call kennel blindness. That's right, and, and you know, I think that's one thing that me and Mike share, is we love dogs, but we don't get emotionally attached to individuals in an unhealthy way. And by that I mean we can have a dog and we can appreciate it for the dog that it is, but we don't necessarily think that they maybe just because we love that dog that it needs to be bred. And I think here again, I'm gonna criticize the sport world, my world, right? I'm gonna criticize them a little bit because I see this a lot where people have the dog and they put a lot of good training on the dog and maybe the dog doesn't have all the genetic qualities that it should have, but with a lot of training and a lot of hard work, with years of work, the handler is able to get the dog um, to some modicum of success, whether it's just a title or whether it's actually podium with the dog. 
and then they've fallen so in love with the dog, they convince themselves that they should breed the dog. And it's like, you see this time and time again. I, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. I once went to um, a, a training and I saw a dog on the field that had been bred and people were talking about what a badass great dog he was. And I saw him on the field and he was lying down next to his handler and his tug was next to him over there. And when the handler rewarded him with the tug, he would take the tug, he would play with her, he would fight with her for the tug. But then when she let go of the tug, you know, and, and was just talking, instead of being on the tug and possessing the tug and chewing on the tug and being engrossed in the tug, he's like, eh, tug, yeah. right? And this is an example of a dog, you know, maybe it's not a bad dog, but it's not a breeding dog because the dog doesn't have the functional drive that I personally would want, and I'm pretty sure what Mike would want, yeah. um, in, in a dog that's actually going to do real world, um, you know, working applications. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to flip something on you real quick, Haz, because I, oftentimes I get critiqued on this or, or, or questioned about it. Why is what you just described, that possession, why is that a, such an important thing for you? Because there's, for me, I call it functional drive. Okay, so like for a ball, for a tug, whatever it is you're, you're rewarding your dog with, functional drive for me is the dog's obsession with the object. And you can correct me if you're wrong because Mike um, is, is, is very well versed in detection work. That's very much his arena. I don't do too much detection work, but Mike does a ton of detection work. And in detection work, ultimately, the dog is not looking for drugs. The dog is not looking for bombs. The dog is looking for his ball. So. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. So especially in the in the beginning stages, right? Eventually, uh, and I'm sure uh, I've I've actually seen it with some of the work that you're doing in obedience with with your competition dogs. Is that the reward is is huge? That ball is is the main motivator for for the behavior. But it eventually, actually doing that behavior can become reinforcing to the dog, and is does become reinforcing. But it's the dr it. Correct me if I'm wrong, because if I'm wrong, Mike, you tell me I'm wrong. Don't be nice to me for the camera. I won't. If, 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 if the dog did not have the drive, the initial functional drive for the object you're rewarding him with, ball, con, tug, whatever, would he have that internal, um, you know, rewarding feeling, that dopamine feeling when he's on odor? So, no, I, I don't believe so. I, I haven't seen that. Um, but I don't think if the dog didn't have that initial possession and desire to have that object, um, that we would be able to get them to the point of making the doing detection or doing obedience be valuable within itself. And I think there's a difference too with, between doing it very well and doing it. Yeah. I mean, for sure, you can get a dog lower drive, medium drive to do it, mm -hmm. but how reliable is that dog going to be day in, day out when he's tired? You know, yeah, and, and that's what it comes down to, and that it again comes back to that our initial hunt testing, right? If they don't have that overall desire to possess and have that object no matter what, they're gonna quit on those initial hunts, right? right? Because they say, ah, well, I do like it, but it's not that important to me. Like, oh, what's oh, there's a butterfly over here, let me go check that out. And I think a lot of working dogs, the Malwas and the German Shepherds today, they have a lot of play drive where. The object and the handler together are very valuable and there's nothing wrong with that, especially from a training perspective. But from a genetic breeding perspective, I don't breed on play drive, I breed on functional drive. If the ball is dead on the ground and the dog walks into the ball, is he interested in it? If we throw the ball in the grass and the dog has to look for five minutes for the ball, is he going to stay in that hunt? Because he has so much desire for the ball. I'm not in the picture anymore. It's just you and the ball, it's you and the tug. Do you want to work for it? Yeah, yeah, and, and definitely because, especially when you get to higher level um, police dog work, right? So I've worked with some, uh, like, they're called TAC unit teams here in Canada, but like SWAT dogs. Um, and a lot of the work that those dogs have to do is independent of the handler and at quite a distance, right? So if we don't have a dog that has an initial, um, functional drive as has is describing to go out into the world and explore and find those things uh it's not going to be successful right it's different between searching a warehouse on leash and going from you know let's say skid to skid versus hey the handlers at the entrance to the ten thousand square foot warehouse and they send the dog in and the dog clears the entire warehouse and he's just going there for the hope exactly he, he has some hope that he might find something that's going to be rewarding for him and if that's all tied up in the handler you might have some problems making some reliability of that task. Yeah, absolutely. And and one of the clearest ways, if you guys actually try this with your dogs at home, you'll probably see it you know, one way or another. 
um, is let, do just a simple field throw like we're gonna do. And if your dog doesn't have that desire and hope for that object just independently, they're gonna come and check back in with you quite a few times. So they'll go out and maybe they don't succeed right away, they'll run back to the handler and be like, hey, help me. And then they'll go back out and run back to the handler, help me. And eventually, if they don't find it, they're gonna stay at the handler. So that's, we want them to always have hope that, hey, if you keep working and, and you do it independently, they gotta have the drive to do it, but you're gonna find it. So I know Mike does it, but for me in my program, I don't breed dogs that don't have functional drive because not only is it very useful from a sport perspective, right? Which is my, I like, I love the sport, right? Um, but it's, 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 in, for me, or, and I think for Mike, it's essential for any kind of real world working applications. If the dog doesn't have functional drive, you know, there's, yeah. there's not so much, you know, you can do with it yeah. in that context. Yeah, and, I, and I'll even take it a step further and say that when I, I can, for the most part, tell by the way that a dog is with a ball or with a tug, how that dog is gonna be when it's biting a person, right? That same attitude, that possessiveness, that this is mine, I wanna hold, just, a lot of these dogs will hover over that ball. Uh, and, and to clarify something, this doesn't mean resource guarding, right? So possessiveness and ownership is separate from resource guarding. So you can have a dog that has extreme levels of possession, but isn't gonna let go of that thing to come bite someone that's next to them, right? Um, so of course, if they are gonna resource guard, they have an element of possession, but it doesn't mean those things aren't they, they don't have to be together. Exactly, they're not necessarily together. So you can have a super possessive dog that doesn't resource guard at all. Or you can have both. Yeah. <laughs> and for me personally, look, I will breed, from my perspective, I, I will ask Mike what his is, I will breed a male, you know, I'll breed to a dog that does have some resource guarding as long as everything else is there, but I'll be very careful with it. And if I have the choice to breed to a dog that doesn't have the resource guarding but has all the same possession, I will do so. Yeah, and, and I think that, again, that comes down to criteria, right? Like what you're looking for in your program. I'm not opposed to that. There's no perfect dog in the world. So we have to say, hey, what are the, the negatives that we're willing to accept to enhance the positives that we want and take that into consideration with who, what those pairings are gonna be. That's right, and, and what we're looking for, um, I think from a pairing perspective is we're always trying to complement the other dog. So if, if, if you've got a female that has a certain number of qualities and traits, and maybe she needs some improvement in certain areas, um, and then you have a male that you think can bring the, the things that she's lacking or enhance the things that she has that are already good and make them even better, then I think that's what we look for. Yeah, absolutely. And because I don't consider myself a breeder by nature, I, when I do breed, I, I breed basically trait for trait. So I, I'm not super, super concerned with paperwork. Um, in like we have pedigrees, but in, hey, this pedigree with that pedigree, I have, maybe I just have limited space in my mind for information, uh, but I, I also equate it to like animals in the wild, right? Like if you just don't, if my criteria for my dogs are I want that possessiveness, that environmental strength, grips, all of those things, and if this was the wild, those things would be what are required by their environment to survive. And if they don't have them, they don't get to produce in the next generation. So that's how I look at breeding. Hey, these things make you survive in the wild so only dogs with these things would survive in the wild and you two are going to breed together and hopefully you know we're still rolling the dice um, your offspring are going to are going to show those positive traits that's right and and um you know personally um you know in my litters i notice a vast like sometimes when i'm doing a breeding i'll have one rock star and then you know maybe four or five of them not so good for from a working perspective maybe good from a family perspective or you know like some light sport work or personal protection work but from a from a breeding and, and top sport or or police service perspective maybe not so good so there's there's a lot of genetic disparity um, that you see even even within the same parent yeah absolutely so i think you know we've kind of and we might come back to it because our conversation is kind of flowing back and forth into different things we might go back to it. Let's talk a little bit, one more thing on this real versus sport. People get obsessed in my, like from what I see, uh, the discussions online and comments on the YouTube channel and stuff like this, people get obsessed, it seems Mike, with what the dog is biting. Is he biting his suit? Is he biting his sleeve? You know, uh, is he barking at the man? All this stuff. And personally, I mean, what do you think about that? I, I want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, so uh, basically, what I'm hearing is like there's a lot of like equipment fixation kind of issues. What 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 equipment is the dog using and whatnot? My 
my opinion on it is it's not so much about what the equipment is, but how that equipment is being used, what state of mind that dog is in while it's biting that equipment. Uh, because the only other way that you're going to actually see if this dog is, is going to bite for real is by taking your arm and sticking it in his mouth, right? So I, I hear a lot about, you know, the dog's not showing real because it, it, it's not in a muzzle. It's not doing a muzzle attack. To me, a muzzle is equipment. So it's, it's not, now I'm not opposed to doing muzzle work. I, I think that there is a time and a place for muzzle work, absolutely. But we can't pretend that the muzzle is an equipment because there's plenty of dogs that I've seen that will put on an amazing fight in a muzzle, but that muzzle comes off and it's a different dog, right? So we can condition them to a muzzle the same way that they can be conditioned to a suit, to a sleeve, to, to those prosthetic arms, all of that, right? Um, that, that's kind of my opinion on it. It's about how it's being used and the state of mind that the dog is in while it's being used. So you're telling me, Mike, that if you back tie a dog to a wall and you're cracking a whip and you're doing the decoy dance back and forth uh, and he's barking, it doesn't mean he's a real dog. That's my, that's my opinion. I could be wrong, you know, but um, I, I, I think if I'm, I'm willing to bet I could get most dogs, and has probably can get most dogs to go on a back tie, and we could get them to bark and, and lunge and, and look, even look like they're going to bite or like even to, bite. Yeah. But there's a vast difference between that dog being, you know, agitated into a frenzy, and then you shoving something into his mouth versus yeah. an actual deployment where the dog has to go out and engage a threat that isn't acting like a decoy and isn't wearing. Yeah, uh, and, equipment. and something that I always say to, to people when we do these seminars is like, hey, dogs are biting for two reasons, because they want to bite or because they have to bite. And me personally, if I'm investing in a dog, I want a dog that wants to be there and wants to be doing this and not, I'm not making them do it. For police service? Yeah. For, yeah is for, there for, some for, exceptions to that rule? Uh, I, I think there would be exceptions to that, to that rule in that... And, and when I'm saying I'm making, I'm, I'm talking about as the decoy, making the dog oh, okay. bite, right? Yes. So like yeah. me, me putting the dog in the corner and, and saying, hey, you're going to bite today no matter what. Yes. Okay. I want the dog that says, hey, I want to be here. I want to fight with that person. I want to fight with that decoy in front of me. And not a dog that's saying, well, this is my only option. My only option is to fight with you here. Mm -hmm. um, for, for my person, the dogs that I would look for it to move forward um, in, in the program. And I would even say, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge sport guy, I don't compete in sports, but we have clients that have competed and, and got titles with their dogs in sports. Uh, so I would say it, it's the same thing for that. Like you can't, you can definitely take a dog that doesn't want to be there and get them to do some of the basic entry level things, mm -hmm. um, but that's going to max out. And, and you, to me, ultimately it's about that dog's state of mind. They should want to be there and they should want to be partaking in the activity. What's the ideal state of mind? What, how would you describe it? just in a few brief words, it, any kind of working dog, what's the ideal state of mind and the protection that you're looking for, Mike? I, I would like intensity, um, dominance, ownership, and intent. Those are the words that I, that I would just kind of describe it with briefly. Um, I, all of those things in a, the ideal state of mind, uh, that's the ideal state of mind for a dog in that, in that type of work, in that bite work, protection work. What about you? What would you? I, I agree. I, I, I want a dog, I call it active aggression. Mm -hmm. I want, I, which pretty much means the same thing. See, this is the thing with the dog training world. We all have different little phrases and words that, that mean something to us, and it might mean the same thing as what he's saying, and, and, or it might not. It's the semantics, right? It's, That's what it is. And we have, you know, people talk about fight drive and defense and aggression and social aggression and prey, and it's like, you know, we can mean a hundred different things. So this is why it's nice to ask people, what do you mean specifically by that? So for me, I call it active aggression. I want to see a dog who's forward, who's confident, who's dominant, who knows how to win the fight, who's in a high state of arousal, but in a clear frame of mind. And, yeah. um, and then once, once they've, uh, you know, closed the distance, engage it with a, in a confident manner. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I think that it's also important to point out that I don't, I, I expect to see elements of that in young dogs. I don't expect to see the full thing together, right? I, I want to see elements. I look at it as almost like, hey, when we're raising young dogs and, and we're teaching them what we're looking for, um, they need to genetically have what's there and, and what, what matters. But we're also teaching them the techniques of fighting, right? Where it's entering uh, your seven-year-old kid into jujitsu. 
Like they're not going in the first day, and hopefully they're not going in the first day, and the 25 year old black belt's beating the crap out of them. No. Right? We, we want them to say, hey look, these are the different techniques that you need to use, and eventually when they get to that point of their black belt, they become dangerous, confident, and, and all of those things that we described. Now imagine if you took that kid and you put him in the dojo, and every day he's getting choked out by the black belt. He's not explaining things properly to him. He's just beating him up every day. We see a lot of that online happening to young puppies. People are blowing off fireworks and yep. shooting guns and there's fire and there's all sorts of nonsense and the puppy doesn't even know how to bite. Yeah. And it's like, what, are we building puppies like that? Yeah, yeah. That, and, and that's, if you look at anything in life, anytime that there's skill involved, the, the best people um, displaying those skills focus most of their time on the fundamentals and the basics of what's happening, right? Michael Jordan would shoot free throws forever. Kobe free throws forever. Tiger Woods just work on his swing. All of these these people focus on those fundamentals, and then yeah, when time comes for fancy things to happen, it happens. That's but right. That's that's what it's based on. Those foundations. Fancy things, and and Mike did a, a fantastic video on does obe. It's called does. Yeah. Does obedience. It's called obedience kills drive question mark. Okay, and that so check that video out. It's a good discussion um, on on you know if obedience you know, kills the drive of a dog and protection work. Yep. And, and there's a lot of myths about that out there, maybe based on some old school training methods, I could be wrong. Yep. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's an interesting video on this topic, so check it out. Uh, I will say this, um, I, if you're, I, I would say that from my perspective, what I want in a dog um, in protection is I want him to be aroused. And I think the biggest reason, I am a I, listen, Again, watch Mike's video. But my perspective is obedience that creates too much concentration and obligation that reduces the arousal of the dog is the fundamental reason why people believe it kills drive. Yeah, so it, it, and that's along the lines of what the video was about. Um, so in, in that video, um, we'll, I'll give you the brief synopsis. Again, you guys can go check that out um, in its full detail. Uh, but basically it's not, I wouldn't say obedience actually kills drive, but it's about how that obedience is done that can kill drive or that can dampen drive. The caveat to that is there are some dogs, and I know Haz has had experience with some of these young dogs and puppies, that no matter what you're going to do with that puppy, you're not dampening any drive, right? So some dogs in these old school systems that can handle that system of draining make for some of the strongest dogs in the world, but there are potentially strong dogs that will, won't survive that system. Does that make sense? It makes what complete sense. And that's what we were talking about with the grind of the sport training. Even like, even Mike saying, you know, basically don't do stupid training. If, if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Don't do stupid training and then expect your dog to do well um, on the protection side of things. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, here's one thing I'll say from a modern, you know, so somebody who, who, who participates in the sport in these days, my concern is training has gotten so good um, and that we're so, uh, people are so good at building dogs, some people, not all people, but some people are very good at building dogs or making dogs appear a certain way that we're losing, people kind of get all kind of uh, concerned about, oh, you know, old school training, oh, that's so terrible, it's so old school. I say, listen, some of the baddest dogs to walk the planet of the earth came through those training systems, yeah. okay? Yeah. They survived the training and they showed themselves on the field to be still powerful even under those horrendous training systems. systems. Yeah, definitely. And that's resilience. That says a lot about those dogs, about that the character of those dogs. Um, absolutely. Now, I, it, and I, I think Haz was kind of touching on it as well. What we have to be careful with is like, yes, we see if dogs can survive that kind of system, how strong those dogs' character are. Um, but with training abilities advancing and us being able to kind of cover up things that may potentially be issues there um, with at, at modern dog training we have to also be really aware of what we see a lot of times can be smoke and mirrors and not actually be who those dogs genetically are and it's no knock at those trainers it's amazing work that they do but we have to also be aware of like, hey, are we looking at this dog for who this dog is, or are we looking at this dog for the amount of time and training that was put into this dog? And it becomes harder and harder to see the better the training gets, 
Um, you know, and, and you have to look for very small things, especially if you're basing your breeding off on-field performance, which I try to never do. Um, and I don't know about Mike, what do you think about that? You're, you're breeding primarily police dogs, yeah? So. Yeah, so, so ours, are, like, I, I definitely would take those things into consideration, you know, what I can, it, you know, if it happens to be. So I, I have bred to, um, you know, sport dogs that have competed in, on, you know, in different sports, but the only ones that I've bred to, I've worked out of the context of sport. So mm -hmm. we've said, okay, yeah, they look really amazing there, that's awesome. Um, let's go into this empty building and, and do some work in here. And there's a, a lot of dogs that I said, okay, never, I don't really want to breed to this one anymore and there have been ones that didn't look like huge monsters on the sport field um, but when I took them into those buildings they performed amazingly as well so they looked really good on the sports field they weren't the best dog on the sport field mm -hmm. um, but they looked really good in those those kind of unfamiliar circumstances and that's training like I know personally for me with my sport dog I've done a lot of things that if I could go back and change how I did it to make him stronger instead of to suppress him in that specific area I would do it but this is the progression of any trainer. You look back on the dogs you've trained in the past and you yeah. think, okay, I won't do that again because I, I could have gotten a better result and I could have shown the whole the purpose. Difference. Yeah, and, and, and if you're not looking back, if you're a trainer and you're not looking back and saying like, oh, I, you know what, I could have done this differently uh, or I, I could have changed this or my next dog I'm going to do this differently with, then to me, you probably should get out of training. Yeah. Because th this is, if we're expecting consistent growth from the dogs that we're raising and that we're training, we can't stay stagnant ourselves. We have to, to, to progress as well and make, we, we owe it to the dogs. They give us a lot and not to sound super fur mommy, fur daddy, we, we owe that to the dogs. Um, we're asking a lot of them, so we, we damn straight better ask a lot of ourselves as well. I agree. I agree. Okay, so switching gears. Favorite breed of pet dog to train Mike because Mike does um, pet training and um, he also does uh, behavior modification yeah the fun stuff all right why don't you talk a little bit just tell them briefly what you do Mike in, in, in terms of like what services you offer for people that have pets yeah so we, we do your regular obedience training um, you know we do on leash off leash obedience um, we do behavior modifications so those aggression cases yeah right now lately I've been working a lot with uh, fearful dogs um, which has been a, a different change of, of pace for me. I like to, you know, switch it up a bit and, and keep it interesting for myself. Um, so we've been dedicating quite some time to that. Uh, in, in general, uh, we, we get kind of a lot of the dogs that a lot of other places won't accept. I know it's similar with you on uh, the, the board and train aspect of things. Um, so yeah, we, we, we focus a lot of time on that as well. And, and, and it's enjoyable. Um, for the most part, you know, I, I like to see actual tangible results in progression. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that there's many things in this world um, that can show you that in, you know, a figuratively short period of time when you can see those things That's actually right. happen, right? And, and the most important thing for us with the pet training, uh, for me anyways, is, is that it's all for me about, it's not maybe necessarily the same as competition obedience or training a working canine, but what we're trying to do is improve the quality of life of the handler and of the dog because usually people are coming to us for training because they have a problem with their quality of life because the dog is doing something that either is endangering himself or other people or other dogs or the dog is doing something that, that just makes it makes living with him not so nice and I you know Mike just like what Mike said for us it's like we're not getting we're not getting very many Labradoodles. And please, bring me your Labradoodles, you know? And I don't know about Mike, but I love, give me your, bring me your Labradoodles. We're getting, you know, the dogs that, that, like he was saying, nobody else wants or takes because they're big, they're scary, and they're doing a lot of things that, you know, a lot of the uh, dog trainers in this day and age, around here anyways, don't seem to know how to fix. Yeah, yeah, we, we get the dogs that have, um you know, but kind of become bullies somewhat in their house, you know. They, they, they've learned that they can say no to people um, by baring their teeth or by putting their teeth on people. Um, and, and we need to show them, uh, you know, the appropriate ways of communicating, right? And saying, hey, wh what's, what's the desired behavior that we have for you? Um, what's the replacement behavior that you can do for these kind of things? Um, so that, that's a lot of what we deal with. Um, and, you know, like have said, hey, send us 
Labs. Send us your 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 dogs. You just want some obedience. Don't send right? them to him. Send Either them or. To me. We'll put rock paper scissors. You call us and we'll play for them. <laughs> you um. can send them. Your, you can send them your aggressive pit bulls. That's his specialty. <laughs> no, that has works really well with those. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, Mike, what's your favorite breed of pet dog? If you had to say, there's one breed. This is a family's coming to you. Hey, we want a nice dog to be a pet for our family, and we want a nice dog that's gonna be relatively easy to train. What's your recommendation? It, my, you know, it, these are always hard questions. because one, one breed. A, a breed. a breed is like a, there's, the disclaimer is that there's shitty dogs in every breed. So when I'm saying the breed, I'm talking about good dogs from that breed. Yes. Um, I would probably recommend like a golden retriever. Like I, I find that they're, that, for the most part, um, they're, they're easy going, uh, they're, they're very trainable, uh, and they're highly food motivated. <laughs> so, you know, for your average pet owner, that, that'll make things much, much easier. And they tolerate mistakes. Yeah, so with the, the Golden Retrievers, I find that they tend to be forgiving of mistakes. Yeah. So you can be a brand new, uh, you know, handler, you can be a, a first time dog owner and you have one of these dogs and very forgiving. You can do a lot, you can do all the wrong things with a good version yeah. of that breed and, yeah. and you can come away, you know, completely unscathed and the dog will be, you know, a fantastic family dog. Yeah, so my, my uh, I have a, she turned eight years old recently, but I have a daughter, she's super into dogs. Um, and so we got her a golden retriever and she does detection work with it. She teaches it to go to a place. She does obedience. So it, it, it's a good, definitely like super forgiving, the, the right golden, super forgiving, super soft of a dog too. Yeah. Like he, he doesn't come in and, you know, plow the kid down cause he's excited. Um, and just all those things like the, are somewhat natural to who that dog is. Right. So you heard it from canine Mike, golden retrievers, good. Well-bred golden retrievers are the way to go. Yeah. So if you were, Mike, just quickly for the folks listening at home that, again, aren't, don't have the working canine experience, you're going, you want a golden retriever for your family. How do you find one? Great question. Uh, what I would do is I would reach out to probably local trainers, you know, and I, I would give them a call and say, hey, uh, it, these are, valuable resources like trainers around you they get their hands on so many dogs um, that a lot of the time they can put point you in the right direction to maybe a breeder that they would recommend i would talk to my vet you know so much needs to be done before you even commit to putting a deposit down on a puppy uh, most of the work is done beforehand so it's finding that breeder talking to those breeders anytime that breeders are seem a little bit secretive with things or they're not trying to give you all the information um, that you know those are red flags also i would look for a breeder that has a waiting list like that would be a sign to me that hey there, there's probably a, a a reason why now that wouldn't be the only criteria but that would be something to say there's a waiting list for puppies uh, i wouldn't just say oh you have three puppies left from a litter i'm going to come and pick one you know before the litter is even born um, I would like to make contact with that breeder uh, and take the appropriate steps. I really like what he said about looking um, at looking, calling local trainers and asking them, because I think that's not something that is commonly suggested online. You know, there's always these online lists of 20 different things to ask the breeder and to look for, and half the time people still end up with with a not so nice dog. Yeah. So, so, but uh, what Kate, what Mike said there was fantastic. Because you know that trainer that actually has trained the dog and 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 did something with the dog if they've they've seen enough of them. Unfortunately, not a trainer like me because I don't get enough golden retrievers yeah. in to make a recommendation for golden retriever breeders locally. But maybe Mike does. And, well, he does because he has one. Um, so you know, I, I really like that suggestion. That's a fantastic suggestion. Yeah, I think you know anytime that you can get because there's also people that don't have any skin in the game to win from it, right? Like for me, it, the ideal client would be someone that said, hey, we're thinking about getting a puppy. These, this is the criteria we're looking for. Can you help us? We help them find that puppy because then it makes training easier. <laughs> like okay. if we start with a really good product or, or, or really good dog to begin with, um, training on us is easier, the family's happier, um, and everything just meshes that much better. All right, Mike. Well, I think we've covered that one pretty well. German Shepherd versus Malinois. Easy. 
Easy answer. And I know Haas, Haas is going to agree with me. <laughs> Malinois, hands down. <laughs> hands down. And, you know, me and Mike are, are similar in that we handle both, and we have both. You know, I have, I have Malinois German Shepherd. Mike has Malinois and German Shepherds. Um, he was just telling me he had a fantastic German Shepherd he just recently purchased. Yeah. Can you see him on your YouTube channel, Mike? Uh, yeah, he's up there. Uh, the video, I believe, is called Testing His Bite, and that's the first bite that we, we've ever given to him. Uh, the dog, this dog is actually pretty special in that it kind of just gets rid of everything that we just talked about, but I bought this dog um, without ever seeing him bite or do any ball hunts. These are, these are small. We're not saying 100% one way or the other. Yeah. We're just saying a personal preference based on our experience and our training style. So yeah. Mike's, a, Mike's a Malinois man, obviously, yeah. and I'm a German Shepherd man. Um, but Mike, what are the things about the Malinois that for you make it um, a better dog? In uh, general, there's always exceptions. Uh, Malinois are just better. I don't think it's that much of an exception. Um, no, I, I, uh, I think Malinois are, are better dogs um, because they're, in my books, the smartest, dumbest dogs that you can deal with. Um, and, and, and when I say that, I mean that generally they don't have that self-preservation that I've seen more popular within the German Shepherd kind of um, breedings in that it, it can be... It can be damaging and good because with a Malinois, you got to kind of protect them from themselves. Like you can play, there's plenty of stories of Malinois playing fetch and smashing their wall, their face into a wall because the ball bounced by the wall, right? Running into traffic and getting hit by a car because they're chasing a ball. So they're so intense in what they do that I like that it can be blinding to them but it's also, it can be damning to them. We have to be careful when we're handling dogs like that. Um, extreme folk, e extreme task orientation is yeah. what you see with a really good Malinois. Yeah, yeah, just locked in and, and, and ready to go. Once they, they know what they're doing, um, what they should be doing, it's like, hey, the rest of the world doesn't exist and, and they're in this zone. And a lot of times with the German Shepherds that I've experienced, of course, I'm being sarcastic, there's really good German Shepherds, uh, but that little bit of self-preservation and almost like they're, thinking things through a little bit more than a Malinois does and then thinks. Um, and, and a lot of times I see a German Shepherd think and then do. I think uh, for me, I've always seen it as a, as a, as a question of, of, of thresholds and reaction to stimuli. So like even good Malinois from my experience, and again, Mike can tell me I'm wrong if I'm wrong, thin thresholds, very little, very thin thresholds for, for them to react to prey stimulation. Um, yeah. and, and that creates a dog that is very, I call them hot dogs, right? Very hot, like they, just like, kind of like if you think about a horse, like very hot blooded, just very reaction, just, reaction. Just looking, consistently looking for something, right? To, to get into something. And like I said before, they tend to overreact to small things. So if you're not such a good handler and you do something wrong, Especially if your dog is in a state of arousal, which Malinois are usually, doesn't take much. Again, the thin thresholds, they're all, it doesn't take much to get them here. Just like it doesn't take much to also get them here, which is the problem, in my opinion. Um, you know, they tend to overreact to small things. Yeah, I, I, and I think along with that, um, you know, one of the potential weaknesses of a Malinois is that they can be pretty handler sensitive at times, right? And, and when he says handler sensitive, he doesn't mean necessarily what you think. Right, like, and again, Mike, tell me if I'm wrong. Handler sensitive is in like uh, suppressed easily by the handler, but also handler sensitive is in handler aggressive. Yeah, sometimes depending on the Malinois that you're dealing with, um, that handler sensitivity uh, can come out in different ways. Right, so sometimes it can be a Malinois or a dog that melts to. to you telling them no, uh, or other times it can be a dog that gives you the finger because you told them no and wants to tell you no instead. Uh, so I, I see that with, with the Malinois a little bit more um, than I would see probably in the German in the German Shepherd breedings as a whole in, in general like general terms. The the other thing that that I, I, I see with German Shepherds that I don't like as much as I like in Malinois is that I think Malinois overall intensity, speed, agility, um, their athletic ability is just better than a German Shepherd. And their drive duration. Yeah. I would say that, like the most, even like with my, when I compare the Malinois that I've had to the German Shepherds that I've had, I find that the Malinois stay and drive and they're a little bit more neurotic about tasks 
than German Shepherds are. Yeah. You know, like for instance, with my German Shepherds, I'll give you an example, something sport related, competition healing, right? Once you teach the Malinois foos, the, the way you want him to foos, he just, he hears it, head up, he's just he's there. going. Like, doesn't matter. You don't have to do a lot of fantastic work to keep him like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the German Shepherd, you have to do a little bit more managing of the um, emotion of the dog, continuously pay the dog, and reinforce the behavior in that, in that uh, specific, um, you know, a command that we're working on. Yeah, definitely. I, I see the same. I, th I think, you know, the strengths um, for German Shepherds and the strengths for Malinois can complement one another so that there have been times and, I, and i've owned I, I didn't i haven't bred them but i've owned dogs that were german shepherd malinois crosses you that's know? right I, I think one thing that you get from the german shepherd that most malinois lack as well um, is that good nose and that commitment to tracking right uh, I, I think sometimes because that intensity and franticness we talk about in malinois mm -hmm. uh, that helps in some places and bite work and doesn't necessarily help them with their nose work all the time, right? Because they just want to go, 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 where that thinking that German Shepherds can do um, sometimes makes it easier to kind of channel them and be like, hey, look, this is kind of unnatural for you. Keep your nose on the ground while we're going. I've definitely seen that on the track as well, the German Shepherds. To, again, we're making broad generalizations. There's exceptions to all these things. I've got thin nerved, you know, thin uh, German Shepherds with thin thresholds and that overreact to stimuli from the handler as well. And, I, you know, I'm sure Mike's got some Malinois that are a little bit thicker in the thresholds and a little bit more uh, handler forgiving. Mm -hmm. So we're talking generalities because that's the only way you can really talk about working dogs yeah. or any kind of dog really. Yeah. There's always exceptions to the rule just like with human beings. Yeah, there's going to be like, you know, a, a German Shepherd out there that will look or behave more like a Malinois than a Malinois. And then there'll be Malinois that behave more like German Shepherds. But the only way we can actually address these topics is if we speak in, in generalizations. Now, Mike brought up something interesting. The mix between the German Shepherd and the Malinois, you see this a lot in the Dutch herders, um, the KMPV dogs, they do a lot of these interbreeding. And personally, I've owned a few. I know Mike's owned a few. Um, for me, if I have to pick one kind of hybrid dog or, or mixed breed dog, for me, this is my favorite mix because I, I find that a good version has qualities of both the German Shepherd and the Malinois it comes together. Now, I've, just be careful, guys. Don't run out in Kijiji yeah. and go get yourself There's one. A, I, I was going to come with a disclaimer for that <laughs> because the good version, he said, has the good qualities of both. Yes. But... There's also the bad versions that have the bad qualities of both. That's right. Right. So that's the thing that you want to look out for. Um, and and I, like I said, I'm, I'm not opposed to, to that that mix uh, of a breed. I, if it comes down to it, and I have to pick uh, a mixed breed. That's what I would go with. Uh, but we have to be careful because we can exaggerate the poor qualities of both dogs in those breedings. Um, and that's what you want to try and avoid. And, and using, again, it, it's not about German Shepherd Malinois, it's not about German Shepherd or Malinois, it's about individuals within the breed, you know? And I've seen fantastic dogs, whether it's a German Shepherd or a Malinois, in the wrong hands. And for that individual, even though that dog is a fantastic example of the breed, it is a terrible dog for that individual. Yeah, and, and that's key. Like we we've had as, as these like Malinois are becoming more popular, we we've, we've had dogs come to us that um, you know the owners say, hey, I have a Malinois and I just wanted to have really good obedience. And we say, okay, well give it a go. They bring the dog in, and I look at this dog, and it needs the outlet of bite work. Like it, it's going to become a problem if it doesn't have that outlet, right? So we have to look at the dog that's in front of us, be fair to the dog that's in front of us, and we can't make that dog be the dog we want it to be if it doesn't have that genetically, right? We respect the dog for who he is and what he is, and um, I, think, I think that's the big takeaway from this. Now, on the other side of what Mike said, I get people in here, they see the, the, the online videos or they, they watch a TV show and they buy a German Shepherd or a Malinois and they say, we want him to do protection. Well, unfortunately, they didn't buy it from a, a good source. They didn't buy the dog from, from somebody that actually breeds for those specific purposes that that individual has in mind. And they thought, oh, it's a German Shepherd. Oh, it's a Malinois. Not it. understanding that there's a vast disparity yeah. within those breeds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like that, that's, we get those calls as well, right? Like, hey, I have a Malinois. I want to do protection work. And we get the dog into the building and the dog is scared of its own shadow, 
and say, okay, this isn't just because you have that dog or you have that breed of dog doesn't mean that that dog is going to have what it takes to do protection, right? Okay. And, and I think the, the other thing to put on that is like, hey, but just because that dog's parents did that work doesn't mean that that puppy is going to be able to do that work. Uh, and the example that I, I try and use when I'm having these conversations is like, yeah, the pedigrees are really important, but Michael Jordan was the best arguably the best basketball player ever um, and most people can't tell me what his son's name is or if his son if it's just off of pedigree and, and like his his son should be better right or, or should at least be as good um, I see a lot of breeders you know whether it's online or in person they're always going on about the pedigree this and the pedigree that and you know oh he's 4'4 four, four and 5'5 five, five on this dog or that dog and then you see the dog it's like I don't care if he's if he's one, two, or what your pedigree says, if your pedigree says it's Jesus' son, this dog is not a good dog. I don't care about the pedigree. And I feel like some breeders, you know, it's interesting. I, I forgot to address that. When Mike said he doesn't really look at pedigrees, I look just to look for red flags. That's it. I don't care three, four generations back who's there. Yeah. It doesn't matter for me. I see the dog. Yeah. And I know if I want to use the dog or not. And, and Pointer, if you're, if you're looking into getting a dog to potentially do sport or personal protection with and you see the dog in front of you and it doesn't seem like it has that criteria, one of the things that breeders will say or that non, not so ethical breeders will say is that you need to wait for the dog to mature and then that's when it's going to be. So when the dog's three years old, then it's going to show you the behavior that you want. And my personal opinion is that you should be able to see characteristics no matter, as long as that dog's older than six weeks, you should be able to see some of the characteristics. I will say this, difference between Malinois and German Shepherds, with German Shepherds, sometimes you have to wait until later. I definitely saw with Malinois, they show like the prey drive a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and the prey drive, it, this is my experience, Mike can tell me I'm stupid if he likes. It, with the Malinois, um, sometimes their, their prey drive even at such a young age kind of overwhelms everything else so you see a dog hanging off the rag and he's doing all this crazy stuff and you think he's fantastic then you see the same dog in eight months he's not so great then on the flip side you see the german shepherd puppy he barely is interested in the rag but he's kind of just normal and easy going and then all of a sudden you see that same dog in eight months and you're like wow yeah and, and when i'm saying characteristics of maturity i'm not necessarily talking about the the display of drive you should see some elements that german shepherd puppy should be at least a bit interested in what, what's happening but something that dogs don't mature out of is nerve right we talked about it earlier so a lot of times i see like oh the dogs the puppy is super nervy and staying in the corner and not recovering oh he just he, when he matures he'll be over that i'm telling you now super red flag that dog and I've, i'm probably wrong at a time there's probably someone there's that's gonna always say, exceptions yeah, but always the majority of the time that dog isn't going to change from that we can never speak in exceptions because then we're, we're 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 going ghost hunting. Yeah. We have to speak in generalities. There's always exceptions. There's always that dog was what looked like a complete nerve bag until six months, and then all of a sudden, you know, his his brain and his heart opened up, and he's fantastic. I do find though, and I again, we'll see if we agree on this. A lot of people have stories. Not so many people have actual proof. Yeah. But absolutely. Right. We'll we'll hear tons of stories about how well this dog did or how great this dog is when it when it like just show, in this day and age there's no excuse to not be able to see it right we're, we're here we're yeah exactly. we all have them guys like if, oh the last time the dog worked it did this all right let's see the video then, we all right? have them we, there, there can be video there can be there's no excuse for not there can't be a, a four-year-old dog that works amazing that there's no video on. and you see this with some trainers they'll say oh i don't feel the need to video my my work i don't need to to prove anything to anybody it's like okay well you kind of do because you're online making all sorts of proclamations, you're taking people's money and you're selling people things, so you do kind of need to show something, yeah, right? That's yeah. my opinion. Yeah, and, and a lot of times it'll be framed as like, oh, you know, this is like some type of secret squirrel club um, that people can't be involved with or people can't see how we're doing. And I think on a training level, that's unethical. I, I think that you should be telling people and letting, hey, yeah, this is how I train dogs. Hey, I, I use e-collars. I use clickers, I use food, I use balls, I use toys, I use, here's all the equipment I use, here's how I use it. We don't need to hide it behind closed doors and, and no, let's, this Watch is Watch out we do. for voodoo peddlers. I yeah. call them voodoo peddlers. It's some mythical secret thing, you know, you have to pay the money to get in the club and it's like, 
if they can't show you some of if you can't watch what they're doing and they can't explain to you properly what it is that they're doing then it's probably some nonsense yeah yeah absolutely i absolutely agree with you and, and i i think it does more damage than good to the entire industry to try and hide things behind closed doors right well my channel guys personally if you a lot of you guys watch my channel you know it's about transparency on my channel i'm i'm brutally transparent about everything that i do and i show the stuff that gets me sometimes in trouble sometimes guys like mike watch it and they're like what the hell is this guy doing? And I know they do, but that's okay. I'm just going to keep on doing what I do. Now, my favorite yeah. video on your channel is when you put the e-collar on. <laughs> that's everybody's favorite That's my video. favorite one. I wish you saved that for today. <laughs> <laughs> you, you tell me you would push the button? Absolutely. I knew he would. Yeah. Would my brother, you know, my brother works for me, guys. He was mad because he wasn't there that day. <laughs> he wanted to hold that button for 10 seconds while I got the 200. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so guys, what we're going to do now is we're going to work a German Shepherd and we're going to work a Malinois and um, we're going to kind of go from there. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Let's get after it. Let's do it. All right. Hey guys, this is uh, Gage. He's here with K9 Mike. Gage is a little bit suspicious of new handlers, so, you know, we're going to see how it goes. Um, but we're going to do some field throws and if uh, Mike gets bit, even better. So. That's right. I don't think he'll make the selection if he gets bit, but that's okay. So it's actually... Key point has pointed out, uh, when we do these these tests, we like the dog to be handled by someone new. He's also having using a ball, uh, it's a ball that we made called the game ball, so it's his first time actually seeing this ball. So we're gonna give him a go, do some field throws and see how he does. All right, you, go, you wanna get the ball off him there, Mike? Yeah, <laughs> Usually we have two balls. <laughs> well, there's only one today, so we're gonna, we're gonna, Mike's gonna have to get the ball, but you know what? When he takes the ball, he's gonna find out something. He'll figure it out. Yeah. So what, what do you see now, Mike? So this is good. He's possessive over it. You see his, his front paws. Um, he wants to maintain it and hold it. This is all things that I'm looking for. So the testing's starting right here. We look for how that dog is. I'm standing over top of him. He doesn't know me from the next person, but that ball matters more to him. Good man. So I'm just lifting him up, like we're not, I'm not asking him to out. Oh, man, and sometimes I'll just let him win it. Good thing. Okay. There you go. I want to see, that's that possession that we were talking about. Now, earlier. now for the sake of the video, um, would you like me to get the ball off of him? Yeah, why not? All right. We're going to try not to get bit, Can but you? if I do. There you go. not going to let him Don't do that. You need help, Mike? I can do this. <laughs> so quick throw. We'll hold it for a sec. Let it stop where it goes. Obviously wasn't using his eyesight there. He faulted to using his nose. Wind's coming in this way. As soon as he got downwind, nice change of behavior, worked his way right back up. So overall, ball drive, pass or fail, Mike? Looking good, looking good. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I would take him so far. <laughs> so Mike's doing the environmental testing now. He's in the exploratory when he enters into this environment. Make some loud noises, see what he does. He's pretty spun up. Good, so right there you heard that bang and turn and wanted to go check it out. That's awesome. Let's see if it will jump up on the table. My shoes are up there. Good, so again, we're doing this with no food, no ball. Awesome. Couch potato. That's why I like German Shepherds. They make great, great couch dogs. So if you're noticing that he's just being super exploratory, wanting to go into things, go look at stuff, this is all things that I look for. So right now environmentally, he looks super solid. He's looking to do something. Doesn't know what he wants to do, but he's looking for something to do. Okay, Mike, so pass or fail on environmentals? All looks good right here. Um, we would nor you would normally do more testing yeah, though. Yeah, so normally we would try and take him into a dark room. Uh, because this is, he hasn't been here, this is unfamiliar to him. Uh, we can see a lot about how, how he feels. But I would try and get him on some open graded stairs, 
uh, and, and slippery services. But so far, all this looks good. Not okay. anything that I would say he's not going to make the cut. All right. Okay. So buy work next. Yeah. All right. So he did, he did well right there. Um, now we're going to again be fair to him. He hasn't. He's had one suit fight maybe before, like that. So he, he's on, on the forearm. So we're going to try and make him feel a little bit uncomfortable and just see how he deals with it. We don't expect for him to perform like a rock star. I just want to see progression and him get it better. actually was talking about in the, the video earlier. That, that puppy that I saw on the fence that kind of stopped me for a second there and yeah. made me think about buying another Malinois. Yep, yep. <laughs> so this is, this is the mom. Um, as you can she, see, she's pretty go mode. Um, but this is that kind of crazy intensity that we were talking about with Mal. So. And you can see how she is with the ball. I haven't touched the ball. Like the ball for me, it's like it's most, a lot of pet dogs you'll see, they'll play with the ball if you throw it, but like no one's throwing the ball. She just has it, and this is how she is with the ball. Destroying. This is that functional drive that we were talking about earlier. Real drive that's not play-based. It's, it's completely just for the object itself, and and that's genetics. Definitely. All right, so we're going to get her off. Lift her off. Oh, you pinch her between your legs. She'll spin on you. Oh, you're really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> not her first rodeo. <laughs> Diva's like, listen. Okay. I'll just video it off, and you can... Oh. <laughs> She's also just a screamer. Yeah, so through it, we'll let her spot where it kind of lands. The general area. There's a Malinois in her. Independently, we're not going to assist her um, and let her figure it out what we want. That intensity that she's showing right now is bang on. Um, so again, we're not super concerned with her finding the ball, just her commitment to searching for that ball. So the other thing that we'll look for is that they range out. When, when that first area that they've been searching isn't producing the results, that they don't have a problem getting further. 
she's been searching now about what is it three minutes four minutes yeah probably yeah so so for you as a from a police dog perspective this isn't your dog and you don't care one way or the other is this what you're looking for this behavior yeah so this is exactly she's been consistently searching her nose is down her tail is going like she's it's it's obvious that she's hunting right now um she hasn't taken any any like breaks or this is what we look for that independence uh, has obviously you're not walking up there and helping her and pointing to the area where it is we want her to discover it on her own and if she doesn't discover it hey failure is part of it you don't you don't find it uh, she's just going though she's nowhere near it but she's still like she i, I don't even know if she's in the old in the, yeah she's way like the ball's way over here and she's way down that way so as long as she's still committed to it um, a slight wind going kind of that way so she's going to need to get on the other side of that ball to pick up odor and, and work her way back to it yeah i didn't even know it was there no neither did i <laughs> so, guys that was like a five minute hunt maybe a six minute hunt right so yeah. and and the dog never quit the dog didn't come to us begging for assistance the dog just went out there and worked and that's all genetic drive that that me and mike were talking about uh i would have no problems breeding this bitch um you know uh if we're selecting based on hunt and i know that she has uh we're gonna we're gonna see the bite work shortly we're not gonna be able to do do a um a uh environmental environmentals we're not gonna be able to do the environmentals just because she lives here and uh we're not that dedicated to this video that we're going to travel somewhere to show them <laughs> um, but uh, we are going to do some bite work so you guys can see you know a little bit of the difference between the Malinois and the German Shepherd but also the shared qualities that we look for in dogs that uh, have real working purposes. Yeah important point with those environmentals is that if you are testing dogs and you're going to do environmentals make sure you leave where they're comfortable because they can show super great where they live and where they're comfortable um, and be shit shows elsewhere. All right, so I'm gonna grab uh, my dog Diva now. We're gonna, I'm just gonna plug her on a, a bite on the bicep there for a has. Um, and we're gonna look at her grip, her biting style, um, and seeing how proactive she's gonna be or not active while she's on the bike. So good? And then keep in mind, it's a three-year-old dog, so I can maybe do a little bit more than what you might wanna do with a puppy. Um, so uh, yeah. I'll be a little bit, maybe a bit more, uh, uh, stronger with her than, than, than maybe Mike was with, with uh, a young dog, but you can still kind of see a little bit the difference. Yeah, and, and the thing that we want to also point out is the clarity, right? Because Paz, less than five minutes ago, well, maybe 10 minutes ago, was just handling her. Now I'm going to go out and grab her and we're going to bring her in and she should be okay with me and, and want to engage and bite with him. Oh! 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 
Can we notice that, that pushing in the mic? Starting in her back end, right? It's not just little oh. nitpicks up front. Fine. She's putting her whole body oh. into it. That's what we want. This is one thing I always liked about Mike's work, is his dogs are very good technically on the pushing. And that's, what do you think that is, Mike? Why is that? Uh, part of it's like, you know, a big component of it is genetic. It's part of who they are, but it's also the environment that we create fosters that. It, it helps bring it out of them. So since day one of them getting here, we teach them that style is going to pay. You pushing like that is going to pay. That's how you win. If you meet conflict, you got to push harder and be more active. showed and the Malinois that Mike showed are both exceptional versions of the breed from a working context maybe not so much from a pet context but from a working context so you might be like well I didn't really see much of a difference well yeah that's because again we're we just showing you two dogs and they're both fantastic dogs in their own right um, for for what's in the breed yeah and 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 to be fair again like those dogs if you're looking at dogs from us, we've gone through a, a, a big selection process to end up with that. Like that's kind of the final product almost, right? Of that selection process. Uh, to me, they won't make, they wouldn't make really good pets, um, but they would make fantastic working dogs. Uh, and that goes, it, it says a lot about Haz's dog uh, because Haz's dog's 10 months around, maybe a little bit older than that. Uh, so showing like that at that age, there's huge room for improvement. Um, and again, it shows you like we're fair to that dog's maturity level, uh, but we can see those characteristics there. There was no fireworks. There was no hoops of fire. There was no, uh, you know, Mike didn't flank him. <laughs> they, we didn't do half the stuff that, uh, you know, some of the, the cowboys online do, but that's because, you know, for us, we don't need to do these things to see the quality in a dog. Um, I think when, you know, maybe when we were, I know when I was newer, I used to put more pressure on young dogs to kind of see what was there, but that's just my inexperience. That was my inexperience, and I don't know about you, Mike. Yeah, and I was the same way. It's like, you don't know what you don't know, right? Um, that's right. And just to kind of wrap that whole thing up, you guys can look online and find plenty of videos of these young puppies doing crazy stuff. It looks amazing to me as well. Uh, but what I ask is like, hey, let's see those puppies in two years. Let's see those puppies in a, a year from now. And for some reason, they're all magically disappeared. I mean, we don't hear about them after those initial videos. Never to be seen from again. Well, guys, um, I think we kind of covered everything that we wanted to cover. Uh, once again, um, check out Mike's YouTube channel, his new YouTube channel. Mike, plug the YouTube channel. Yeah, so just Grassroots Canine, um, and that's a letter K, number nine. Um, I'm sure we can put it in the, the description of this video. We will. Check it out. We'll have a lot of stuff there. And uh, we plan on in the future, you know, bringing Haz over or maybe me going over to Shield Canine and doing this again and putting some stuff up on, on my channel as well. So check it out. There's a lot of information uh, both ways. I'd like to take a moment to thank um, one of our sponsors, um, Eric Outdoor USA. Uh, they provide the training pants um, that I'm wearing and that Mike should be wearing. If he was smart, he would be wearing them. Um, fantastic pants. They stand up to a lot of damage, including what you just saw with Mike's dog uh, biting me. I wasn't wearing any suit pants. And, uh, you know, while they might not stop teeth, they would definitely um, prevent, you know, from the scratching and, and, and all the rugged stuff that we go through as dog trainers. Uh, they're fantastic dog training pants and they're comfortable as well. Uh, use promo code SHIELD10 to save 10% um, on your next Eric Outdoor USA order. Thanks for watching, guys. 
like, subscribe, comment below whether you agree, disagree. If you disagree with Mike, go to his channel and comment on his videos. That's definitely the disagreement. And if you like his stuff, like and subscribe to his channel as well. Thank you very much, Canine Mike. No problem, man. Thanks for coming out, and I look forward to doing this again with you. Man. Yeah, we've been doing stuff for years, so we'll probably keep doing yeah, stuff. Yeah, now we just got to do it all on camera. That's right. All right. All right. Thanks, guys.